in this series, the Lord's words to his congregations revealed, of course, to the Apostle John in what we call the Revelation. The message of the Lord to his people, concluding the inspired text of the New Testament. Uh, of course, in this sermon series, we're complimenting the class that will begin by Ron, and we're spotlighting it. We're encouraging you to partake of this. If my assignment for this series were a one hour. A lot more, I would say a lot more, and uh, in a lot of details that we just can't get to in class. That's why it's easier and prudent for me to provide you with, through the church email and, and outlines, extra content for you to study on your own time. And all that extra study brought to the services will help you get more out of what is shared. You'll be hearing more than what is actually spoken. But I will be bringing out from each congregation's focus at least one or two central key themes and maybe one key point to live by and to employ so that every other thing that's wrong with each one congregation that's addressed or that needs to be greatly improved can be applied to ourselves. If Jesus were to inspire a letter, oh, just think about this. Every preacher, every elder thinks about this, I know. Maybe you, if, if the Lord himself were to write a letter to this congregation, what would it say? Uh, I mean, we can think of a lot of things, perhaps, but what, what would the Lord say? The Lord always finds ways to express himself that, I mean, he always knows ways to express himself that would be surprising, not expected, but right on target. What would the Lord say? This is a rhetorical question, but it's more than that. I want to know what would the Lord say to Oak Hill? Well, in my desire as a pulpit minister for sure to help the congregation always be pleasing to him and each member as you live throughout the week, I want to see, I want to see how he sees our relationship. How is it really? I've always said the Lord knows our hearts, so let's make sure we do as well. I would enjoy, I would thoroughly enjoy hearing and be edified and strengthened by hearing the approval and the praise of all the things that we are doing correctly. I would love to hear him say, you've got this right and this right and this right. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad that you see that and know that I know you see and it's encouraging. I'm glad that we're pleasing to you in this way. But in order to be maturingly, increasingly pleasing to his sight, I want to then, well, I have to necessarily accept whatever rebuke or counsel would have to be addressed towards those things not quite right as well. What about you? What about you and your heart right now? Are you in your heart eager to be so pleasing to the Lord that you are willing to hear whatever rebuke and or counsel has to address those things in your life that are not quite right? Are you eager for that because your goal is to please the Lord and grow closer to Him? If that's not where you are spiritually right now, then this lesson absolutely is addressed to you. So what would the Lord say to Oak Hill? Of course, I'll emphasize, as I hold up my favorite copy of the Bible, that the Lord's inspired message to all His congregations, to all His, well, to all His people, to His which has been re generation to to all of us is it. and we need to live by it it contains all we need as we are reminded today even if we can perfectly Two and chapter three, Jesus specifically addresses unique message to each, but principles that can be applied to all of them. And in Ron's class, I think he's already stated this, and I know he's provided a number sheet for you based on what we do know and can understand. Even the number seven in Revelation is symbolic. Even the number seven. These were little literal places, of course, but there are. Not, that's not the only ones. That's not the only congregations. 
But this is number seven because it's a representation of divine completion. Revelation chapter 2 begins by describing Jesus, metaphorically, imagery, walking among seven lampstands. That's a dramatic way of saying that God, Jesus, is with His people, with His redeemed, who are in robes of white, who have been the blood-bought church, and that He is the light they are to reflect and shine. I I love Revelation. Like I mentioned in class, it's my favorite. I love the encouragement with the understanding that we can have and do have. We look forward to studying this with Ron. But it's a dramatic way of saying the Lord is with his people. He knows you and he's got some messages for you. The elder apostle John, while he was on (laughs) exiled on Patmos, exiled on the island of Patmos, Uh, The Lord revealed a marvelous message to his people to be quickly taken to the congregations there. And the primary message of John's recorded revelation of Jesus Christ says that, yes, I know you're facing trials of various kinds. The trials will soon be over because the word revelation, apocalypse, is the, the, the revealing of Christ himself. Christ is supreme. Christ is sovereign. And the imminent victory, that's the key, the imminent victory, that is to all people who stay faithful. Appreciate the emphasis of the scripture reading earlier with the word faithful. That will come into play later. This message was dramatized in a vision, heavy in symbolism, and the congregations needed strength to persevere. We will appreciate that more the more we appreciate the setting and the circumstance under which they found themselves. But each message, again, is so personal and yet so applicable that we will be asking what was the message to them then, and then how does it apply to us today? And in the order listed... This message was to be carried to the congregations there and likely arriving first there. Likely, perhaps, around the congregations listed there around the roads that would have been uh, in place, likely travel clockwise, if that be the case. It's just interesting to think about. It does lie. So from the, as mentioned earlier, The doctrinal statements that we have in Paul's epistles to them, to the, uh, to the Ephesian uh, brethren, and also to the two epistles that he wrote especially to Timothy as well since he was left to work with them. We can learn so much about the congregation of Ephesus. If I don't say this, I'll forget this. It might be a great 13-week quarter series to look at the, the establishment and lifespan of Ephesus within Scripture. We know so much about it, and there's so much to discuss that relates to us. That journey alone would take a long time, but we are hitting some highlights today for your personal review later. We are allowing all inspired text, everything that is in Scripture about Ephesus to say, okay, from a, from a bird's eye view, from a helicopter view, maybe a drone's perspective, what's the one big point that we are to, to learn from God's message to this congregation? And I think we can't help but recognize something as we look at nearly 40 years, almost 40 years. When we think about Oak Hill's congregation, do you realize that we, at this building, this establishment on this hill, according to the records, I think we've been here about three-fourths of that time, close to that time. By the time John recorded Jesus' message to Ephesus, we've been here three-fourths of the time since then. So we just can't help but wonder. Not, time is not the only factor, but we can't help but wonder, if the Lord were to write a letter specifically to Oak Hill, would he say the same thing to us as he spoke to them then? Well, let's read and see how it applies. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Here we go. The word messenger is used to the angel of the church of Ephesus write. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand. God has his people. He knows you. Who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. He is the light. I know your works, the Lord says. I know your labor. I know your patience, your endurance. And that you cannot bear those who are evil. And that you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not. And have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Verse 4. Oh, nevertheless. 
Well, there's always room to grow, but what's the problem here? Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. So remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. It's that serious. But this you have, and he says, he accommodates them again, but this you have. You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate, which we will mention and describe later. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will eat, I will give to eat the tree of life. We need that life. His word is life. He is the life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So for quick review, though not yet specifically stated, the Ephesus congregation began around the mid-50s during Paul's second missionary journey. By, th- by, uh, by Paul's third missionary journey, he was able to stay with them about two to three years. And the congregation was growing. It was thriving. It was even said in Acts 19 that all of Asia was able to hear the gospel and the word was increasing and prevailing mightily. The church at Ephesus then in the mid-50s began well. Most of them begin well. But you know the phrase... Well begun is half done. That's a good phrase. Well begun is half done. That's so true. Start right. Start correctly. But you also know the phrase, half done is half baked. I don't want anything half baked. I want it done. I want it like it should be. The church at Ephesus by the mid-90s, I believe that's the accurate date because of our take on Revelation's dating, but that's another detail. I'll let Ron deal with that. Almost four decades later, it had begun to mirror, and other commentators bring this out more than I will in this lesson today. Other, it has begun to mirror some of the lackluster decline of the city itself. Some things had already begun to take place, and some things soon would. That's historical stuff, but they needed to hear this one rebuke so that regardless of the culture around them, they stayed strong. And that's the idea. I think that's the main emphasis would help them. Everything that they would hear from the Lord's counsel and rebuke would help them finish strong. You've got to stay strong to finish strong. Which means you've just got to stay faithful and endure and have that passion. Never lose it. That's the key message of the day. I think that's the one main point. When I think of Ephesus, all the scripture is telling us through them, stay strong, finish strong. Jesus is commending them for the inspired doctrines that they are believing. Yes, still believing those truths. Jesus is commending them for all of the righteous behaviors that they are still practicing. That's good. Great. Keep it going. Keep it up. But what's the serious problem here? He says, if you don't repent from this, you won't be in my presence, which means you won't have salvation. That's very important. What could be so serious? Well, first of all, he says there's only one way to finish strong, and I'm about to tell you. Rating purposes or they're believing right, and if they're doing right, they would be lost. It's because the nature of his admonition, his one admonition, literally, truly, genuinely targets the heart of the matter. You simply will not finish strong. You won't even finish this lifelong marathon properly unless, unless you restore your love for the Lord. Unless you restore that early first love for the Lord. They had had something then and they had lost it by now. No matter what they were continuing to do, we are creatures of habit. You can do the right things but not in the right spirit and still be wrong with the Lord. So I think about this. Soon after I moved to Oak Hill here in Rome, uh, and I was looking at the calendar last night, actually. Curious about that. Eight years and four months. Doesn't seem like it. Uh, That's incredible. Eight years, four months. Goes by so quickly. We had the um, uh, 25th anniversary then. 25th anniversary service, I believe. I think that was the number. And I learned a lot about Oak Hill. And now it's since been printed in some of the directories and some of the articles and bulletins 
of late. But how many of you know the story of Oak Hills merging that long ago? I almost took pictures of the pictures that are framed out front, but I said, no, I'm going to encourage you to spend some time in the foyer fellowshipping today and look at those pictures. Ask around because you might be in those pictures. You might know some people in those pictures. And if you don't know anyone in those pictures, their history is yours because you are here. We are here because of them. So think back to the idea of congregations merging to be here. The, the passion, the excitement to combine forces to be a brighter light for the Lord in this community. Do you remember the great works that were begun? And do you remember the good works that have happened since then? The, what was in the future is now the past. And the excitement that was still in always is to be in our hearts for what is ahead. Do you know that Satan took notice of that? He frankly tries to continue, well, he, he continues, he makes efforts every day to work with other people and sometimes ignorantly from those within to thwart the good deeds that we strongly want to have done. But we still work for the Lord and we get a lot of things done, despite opposition in the spiritual realm. I think Oak Hill has endured very well. I do. I do think Oak Hill's endured very well. Statistics that I've learned over the past few months are not encouraging, except when you look at Oak Hill. We've done very well in many ways. But in other ways, maybe not. Again, we're making a list, we're checking it twice, and we have a lot of great classes and sermons up ahead to help. If the Apostle John were writing a letter to us, what would he have to write? Would he also have to write, brethren, great start, great past, but the past is the past. I want you to stay strong and to finish strong. And I'm concerned that many of you won't because the Lord sees the hearts of, of everyone and in the hearts of so many, that same early passion and love for the Lord just isn't there. And it absolutely must be. Have our convictions been turned into mere points of condemnation? Have our righteous routines just become a heartless rut? And in some ways, have we started to reflect the moral decline of our culture? Oh, there's a series there. More brightly than the truth of Christ. Are we so far from him that we don't even see how brighter he is in contrast to what the world has accepted and it's wretched? Such distraction on the part of those who claim faith in Christ can only be attributed to, if you're not maturing and have once matured, to then go back to where you ought not be, best explained by being dangerously close to no longer being in love with the Lord. This is Jesus' final inspired note to the congregations there. And beginning in Revelation 2, the Lord has said to Ephesus, something serious I have against you, that you have abandoned that love you had at first. You don't love like that anymore. It's not there. So remember how back in Paul's time he had to warn the Ephesian elders that this type of thing could happen? The situation was a little different back in Acts chapter 20. But he did warn the elders of things that say, watchful for the flock, be mindful, care about them, be observant of the spiritual warfare around because you don't want the brethren to drift away from the problems of the day. And there are so many ways to drift from the things around us. Think about over eight years, culturally speaking, and, and around the world, we've gone through so much together. We've got to stay... Courage from all that he's going through. He didn't want the suffering and the trials and the persecution that he was facing to be a discouragement to them. So he says, I want you to be strengthened by what I'm going through for your sake. He, in other words, again, this is the same theme over and over. He wanted them to stay strong, to be strong, stay strong, to finish well. And Timothy was, of course, assigned to help this great work. And he did so much work. I enjoyed a year or two ago studying those epistles in detail. 
uh, and as a preacher, they all certainly do, but as a Christian, we all should. Paul encouraged and Paul counseled Timothy to stay focused on Christ and his truth, keep preaching it in love, and being an example to all those around so that you win souls and keep the congregation strong. I think any preacher, any Christian wants that. This type of work must never quit. This type of work must continue. And in order for that to be, the love has to be embraced. It has to be passed on as well. But by the mid-90s, many at Ephesus are... I wonder, how many at Ephesus by the mid-90s A.D. Uh, were charter members who were still there from the beginning? I wonder that. How many were the second generation? How many were grafted in from the world and converted to Christ? I, I don't know the exact numbers of that, of course. But it's interesting to think about because Jesus is telling all of them this as a whole. Revelation 2. Remember, picking up where we left off, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, if not, I, the Lord, will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Oh, we don't want that. We don't want that unless you repent. Well, if repentance is continual, we need to stay focused on Him. You know, the greatest blessing offered to anyone is salvation. And therefore, the greatest concern is losing it by our choice. The greatest challenge... For any congregation is to, well, stay strong, to finish well. Because there are so many forces at play that disrupt that goal and discourage it. And sadly, it's all too common for congregations to go from being strong to weak, uh, from activity to apathy, from action to complacency, from life to death. Uh, to death. And we don't want that. I think the elders here and the members here certainly know anyone who gets involved in those behind-the-scene ministries that have to take place. Uh, they know that Satan works very diligently to, to do several things. To keep people out and those from within to just drop out. And even if you can't do those things, to just gradually fizzle out so that you're not as effective as you once were and are described by Jesus' message to Ephesus here in Revelation 2. That love is just not there anymore. That's, that's, that's not good. So Paul's instructions to the Ephesians still applies and blesses those who apply it. Ephesians 6. This is all the same congregation at just a different time. So let's go to Ephesians 6. Some of my favorite passages here, my favorite verses in verses 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. We've got in all of the theme of the day to finish strong. Here's how we need to do it. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Brethren, this spiritual war is hard fought, and it requires us to be dressed up in and stay disciplined in the use of God's very armor. Jesus did praise them for all that they were doing right. He said, great works, much effort, patient endurance. You know truth from error. That's good. You can't tolerate false teaching and false prophets. He even made reference to some people who he said, you, you even can't stand the idea of imploring grace and forgiveness to justify the pursuit of sin. And we better not do that either. But, but, many, many Christians get dressed in that armor and just let their battle skills begin to wane. Their spiritual discernment decrease and digress. Their use of the sharp two-edged sword begin to get rusty. Their prayers simply take a pass. And their fellowship forfeited and foregone. However it happens to any individual, however the devil wants to work and target you, whenever that initial motivation is lost, and we all go through cycles, of course, ups and downs, emotionally speaking, but it's not just emotion. It, it, whenever that motivation, commitment, devotion is gone or, or suffering, you are found standing on the battlefield, maybe still in the armor, but in danger of losing your life because you're not using it properly. How do we finish strong? That's the question. The Lord essentially said, 
the answer. You need to restore the passion in, of just being in my presence. And I, I think that's really it. Do we just love the Lord so much we can't wait to be in his presence and we pursue it more? I, I saw a list of five or six reasons why I'm looking forward to going to heaven. And the first one was because God is there. And the second point was because God is there. And the third point was, well, you get the picture. God is there, and I want to be in his presence fully. The best is yet to come for the Christian who stays faithful. I love the Lord now. I want to learn him more. And that manifests itself in the types of things we're supposed to do by command, but love removes that sense of burden, doesn't it? I uh, wonder what this means. You've abandoned your first love, or you, you, know, you no longer have that first love. And, and if you read different commentators, they'll each say maybe different things and argue the case well and have some great points to discuss. Of all the ideas, I found a great one-sentence potent summary that lists so many things that could be what's meant. But since it's inclusive of many things... I just want to read this to you, and it's not on the screen. I just want to make sure I speak it very clearly for our benefit. And if you want the full quote, just see me afterwards, and I'll even cite it for you. It says, Fervent, personal, uninhibited, openly displayed first love is the devotion to Christ that often characterizes the new believer and is manifested in relationships with fellow Christians and the lost. Is that not great? Well worded. So true. That's it. The, the love descriptors, the dynamics mentioned here are the many possibilities and probably more that could be implied by this first love lost. So whatever it was, whatever it was, it was right for them at the beginning, but it's not that way now. Well, what about us? What about you? Will you take the time, and I, I ask you seriously, will you sincerely take the time this afternoon to give yourself some quiet, alone time to reflect and, and assess the condition of your soul to see those things that were in your prior Christian days, earlier days, earlier days, that were right and passionate and well and good, but now you have to be honest, not just because of health concerns perhaps, but in your spirit are just not there right now in your current walk with the Lord. And that exercise will bless you as you come back to these three points. It will bless you as we look at Jesus' instruction, not just for preservation, but for passion in life. This type of restoration, we're going to get the points down and then apply them later to, to ourselves, requires, number one, remembering. That's straight from the text. Remember where you were. To dwell on your relationship with Christ and how it was at the beginning when you were first saved. Remember that? Coming up out of that water of baptism, that watery grave. To rise, to walk in newness of life, to know, to know that your sins have been forgiven by His power. To rise, to walk in newness of life, aided by His grace to pursue righteousness. Remember that feeling? That helps recall how you used to witness for Him. And I say the word witness to evangelize and tell other people about Him. And how grateful and how gratefully confident you were to trust Him to take care of you over life's simplest things. How much would people pay to not have to worry about anything? And you're trusting in the Lord and also the greater needs of life. Remembering will generate that desire to have that blessing again. Restoration then requires repentance, repenting. And since repentance or, or repent means to turn, to follow, to fully depend on or to fully lean on, being written to Christians who've kind of lost some of that love from the beginning... Applied to Revelation chapter 2 in context, it means to return to Him, to change course, reverse, go back to Him. Let that first love return, and it will as we pursue Him. It's on this thought that I'm also reminded, and you can make a side note to chapter 4 of Ephesians. To the same congregation, again at different times, but to be applied at all times, chapter 4 verse 1, Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you, and that's a key word, urge you, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you were being called. 
You say you're a Christian, live like it. Paul gives five characteristics to then de- de- describe our own character. And I'm thankful God knows our hearts. We've got to work on how we discern other people's lifestyles and different cri- living. But, but you should walk in all these ways. Christ should be defined in every one person's life like this. Humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love and love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Those are the five descriptors that describe a Christian's walk. And here in Revelation chapter 2, we can presume that if this was how that they were told to walk, some had continued in this way, and well, frankly, others had not. Some were walking in the right way, but not with the right heart. That makes all the difference. So again, simple phrases, proverbially speaking, you know the phrase, or maybe you've not heard this one, it's not as common, but it, is, it does float around there. Forced love is no love indeed. Because love implies choice. That's the one you probably know. Forced love is no love at all. But you also know this phrase. Love turns do I have to into I'm glad I get to. It removes that sense of burden. And so we think about the command in Scripture and the greatest command. Loving the Lord with your all is the greatest command. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what we're here for. But notice Paul uses the word urge. He urges them to stay as they ought because he knows he can't force them. He does everything he can within his power to influence. But not even God will override your will to love him. Isn't that incredible? Because then it wouldn't be the true love, the necessary love that he wants to see in you to make it genuine and authentic. He's done everything to show us how much he loves us. The soul-saving restoration begins with remembering and repenting and then, here it is, repeating. Repeating those first love actions which both reflected and nurtured that love. This is good advice for any relationship. But what were those early faithful steps? In our Christian walk, think about this. What were those early faithful steps which so describe all of us? All of us gave so much attention to these so early on as we were learning all about how to live this new covenant with the Lord. And the same are the same ones today. Same ones then are the same ones today. Study. Prayer. Singing. Serving, worshiping, fellowship, and evangelism. How's your studying going these days? How's your prayer life? They do kind of go together. If one is weakening, probably the other one is too. How's your singing these days? I'm not talking about the quality or the uh, ability of your voice. Have you allowed Satan to justify your non-participation in a commanded act of worship that blesses you more than you know when you participate? How's your serving? Whatever talents and skills you have, whatever abilities anyone can do with the services and the programs and activities that we have here in a structural system, but also in your own Christian walk. Stay busy doing good things. If you're busy for the Lord, you'll never be bored. I love that phrase. I remember it was a spinoff of a phrase because I go to the skate park, I bored for the Lord. I said, that that doesn't sound too good, but, but if you're busy for the Lord, you'll never be bored. Because he knows, let me reword this, because he knows that those are the good works that we've been prepared to do. What about worshiping? What about fellowship? What about evangelism? How have you been doing it all of these these days? Now, I tell you, we, we need this constant rebuke every day, don't we? I mean, we really do from time to time. We need this same constant counsel because we all still struggle every day. The phrase, feelings follow actions, well, that's a proverbial truth. We've mentioned before the alternative, but in this case, we don't have to. You know the phrase as well, where the will goes, the heart will follow. Commitment and love. Huh. Love is emotional. Love is also commitment. Love is devotion. It's interesting. You know, both of these phrases are true. And I've thought about what the word is as a sharper, a two-edged sword, sharper than even that. 
maybe the word of God is only able to make distinction between the nature of our commitment to him and our heart's love for him. But I'll tell you this, they have to be interwoven. They have to be together. According to what Jesus says, I've got to maintain my heart's love for the Lord. And I know it's been a simple message today, a lot to enjoy discussing, but if you walk out the door and someone asks you later what was the lesson was about, oh, loving the Lord, staying strong. That's it. I pray that we decide to examine ourselves today. I pray and I have prayed that we will commit to letting our heart, soul, and mind simply fully love the Lord like we're supposed to. And we have a lot of things to come up, exciting points to look forward to in this series. Uh, and that's how we will finish strong. And I think when we do these things, remember, repent, and repeat, we will have that first love return. And here is a key point. I mentioned I would say it towards the end, and here it is. This is a clarifier. This is a, a disclaimer, but it's also a very strong point to keep us in check. A faithful life is a condition of salvation. Absolutely. A faithful life. You know, I think about the past 20 years of ministry. I take joy in that. Uh, the satisfaction pleasing. But what if I quit serving the Lord? What, what good would that do to me? What would all those 20 years do for me if I quit the Lord right now? Nothing. It would bless others, perhaps, from the work I've done. But I need to stay faithful. I need to stay in love with the Lord. So yes, a faithful life is a condition of salvation. But like the Ephesian brethren, we must remember Galatians 2.16, the truth he also wrote there, prison epistle. We must remember that merely doing good works does not save. Perhaps the right spirit behind all those good works will also be restored when we remember Ephesians 2.8. How we felt to be initially saved by His grace through faith, that genuine, loving faith, which I will add is what we are continually saved by as we walk in the light. It's a carefully crafted phrase that as we are continually obedient, it is still that grace through faith that makes salvation possible. We obey because we love. Do you love the Lord, Oak Hill? Do you need His forgiveness and salvation? Will you respond to the gospel in water baptism to be blessed? with His Spirit to rise and help you walk with your desire, the Christian life. All the blessings are in Christ. Romans 6, 3 through 5 tells us how we get in Christ. It's a faith response where we yield to God's authority and He does His work that only God can do to forgive us of our sins. God says, if you want it, it's freely given. Here's how you can take it. Come and unwrap the gift. And you'll live faithfully to it if you love them. As we stand and as we sing.